Uh, today I will share with you uh, uh, our recent results on the uh, understanding why uh, multi-modality learning can perform better than single modality. Okay, the topic is actually kind of huge, and then you sort of see that the model we we use is uh, is is in some sense quite general also, but it's uh, there there are still many open questions still not solved. And so this is a joint work with my student Yu Huang and my colleague uh, Hang Zhao and his student uh, Chen Zhuangdu, and also uh, uh, Zhi Huixie from UT Austin and then the Xuan Yao Chen from Fudan University. All right, so <laughs> multimodality learning. I guess uh, I'll just do a very brief uh, introduction because uh, uh, maybe some of you have not heard about this. So our experience of the world is actually multimodal. So in the following sense. So every day we listen to uh, audio and we also see a lot of texts and uh, vision as well. Uh, so and many other sort of uh, data or information, of course. And so we also based on all this information to make our decision, uh, decisions on what to do and, and how to react to each one of them. And so that's good. And uh, in fact, if you look at the, the deep learning, the uh, technology or the development recently, or people have been using deep learning on the many single modality training uh, uh, applications. For example, uh, computer vision. Here we know that uh, uh, since the birth of uh, neural networks, uh, people have been developing many uh, good uh, algorithms that outperform prior results, or NLP. Uh, so transformer, uh, I guess we, we've all heard about this word. So transformer-based uh, sort of algorithms are also making very good progress. And, but recently, people have also started to combine different modalities. And uh, they've been observing very good progress or very good advancement by just integrating the, the uh, different modalities, different information. So I'll, I'll give uh, two concrete examples. Uh, the remote sometimes I need to press it twice. Okay, so <laughs> the first example is this uh, DALI. Uh, it's developed by OpenAI. It's, it's uh, basically for a text, it uses text and image for chaining. And what it can do is that if you write a sentence, it can generate an a image. So the first one here, I'm not sure if you can see, but it says an illustration of a baby a uh, daikon radish in a tutu walking a dog. And if you look at the, the figure, it's actually good. I mean, there's something walking a dog. And then the second, second image here is an, uh, an armchair in the shape of an avocado. And so if you look at the chairs, they're actually good. These are AI-generated uh, images, so it's good. And then a second example is actually, this one is actually uh, developed uh, here at MSRI. Uh, it's called the Layout LM 2.0. It's for intelligent document processing, and it uses different type of uh, information, uh, including text, image, and the layout of the form. Okay, so many of the forms, you want to automate the processing of those forms. It's good to combine different sort of modalities, and then they can achieve good performance. And let's see, so there are many other examples. I'll just, just give a few. So audio-visual uh, chaining. Uh, one simple example is that recognizing sounds and here, the, just, just think about this problem. So if you want to use uh, uh, audio to differentiate the, the word C and the letter C, it's kind of difficult sometimes, right? Because they pronounce uh, the, the same, essentially. Or if, if I give you two pictures and I ask you to, to tell me whether or not the mouse is producing P or B, it's also sometimes difficult. But if you are able to combine the two, then it's good. Suddenly, it makes the problem easier. And uh, there have been a lot of progress in this audio-visual application. And also in visual text, here's an example of a visual uh, question answering. Uh, so you're given a, a, a question, a text, and then you're also given pictures and you're asked to answer questions. And so here also there have been a lot of recent development. And uh, RGB and D, this is, it's also easy to explain. So you're given a uh, RGB picture, and also you're given another picture that contains the depth information of the objects in the, in the, in the picture. And so by combining the two, it makes it easier to recognize the objects. Whereas if you're just given one, sometimes it's hard. And many other examples, uh, such as autonomous driving, you're given video, you're given LiDAR information, you're also given the inertial and, and the GPS data, and that helps you to learn. And some other examples include the uh, human-robot interaction and also brain tumor cells. Okay. So many of them, very exciting, and people have been uh, enjoying the progress. Uh, but then something we, we notice is that although many of the solutions proposed are very efficient and uh, successful, many of them are also intuitive and correct, 
sometimes, so, somehow the theoretical justifications for these results are, are sort of uh, falling behind. And so in this work, we basically, we try to answer the following uh, question. We hope to establish some rigorous uh, uh, justification for this. That is, uh, can multimodal learning provably outperform or perf perform better than the unimodal? So before I do that, uh, before I present our results, let me first do a quick overview of the existing theoretical results. Uh, so there have been a set of results on multi-view analysis. That is, they try to understand why if you use different sort of feature groups to learn, can actually improve the performance of using just a single feature. But they make the assumption that each view alone is sufficient to predict the target accuracy. And we know that this sometimes doesn't hold because if you want to recognize a cat in the picture, uh, sometimes if I just give you the depth information, it might not be enough. And there have been other results. Uh, this uh, CPM net, uh, it, it looks at the problem from an optimization perspective and try to understand or try to uh, uh, show that multimodality learning is actually uh, good. And also there is a TCGM, I'll not get into details, but it's an information theoretic framework that uh, basically, again, try to establish the, the fact that using multimodal is, is, is good. But they also make the assumption that conditional independence across different modality. The, the idea is that given the label, they assume that the, the data is, that the different data are essentially independent. Uh, but this does, may not always hold in practice. And also, of course, there's a, a literature on the transfer learning uh, analysis. Uh, but here, it's uh, because you want to transfer the, the learned information to the other the tasks. So sometimes they assume that, uh, it's often assumed that the, the, the feature mapping, uh, basically they, they, belong, they, they have the same function class. Okay, so all these might not hold in the general multimodality learning uh, framework. And so our contributions are, uh, first, we, formulate, we, we formalize a multimodal learning problem into a general mathematical framework. And then under this framework, we probably answer the following two questions. One is, under what conditions multimodal performs better than unimodal? And then what results in the performance gain? Okay. All right, so next I'm gonna present our mathematical model. So it's, it's as follows. So we're given a set of multimodal data uh, denoted by uh, Bo X, uh, which is X1 all the way to X, XK, so K is the uh, number of modalities we have. So each XI is the ith modality. And that belongs to some uh, uh, joint data space or input space. And then for each data, X, there is a target, Y, in the target space. You can think of that as uh, some sort of a label. And then there is also a latent space. This latent space is actually, uh, it's, it's quite common in representation the learning. That is, you're going to map your data into some sort of a, a latent space and you get its representation. And so here we assume that there exists a true latent mapping that gets the data from the data space into the uh, latent space. And then there is also a task mapping, H, that gets from the latent space to the output. And uh, for data distribution, we actually do not uh, assume much, except that it's generated from some unknown distribution D. It's basically it's P, P of X times P of Y given the, uh, the mappings. So in the diagram form, it, it looks like this. So we have an input space, X, and then there is G that maps it into the latent space, and then there is H mapping uh, gets it into Y. Okay. Now, so here, uh, I just wanna quickly mention that we allow general data space and function classes to, uh, to allow the heterogeneous data. Okay. And also we allow the uh, different mappings for different mod modalities. And so to also the, allow us to treat the, uh, a subset of modalities, we use M to denote the, the set of modalities we use. And we use G of M to denote the induced function class. That is the function class operating on only the M modalities. And then we define the empirical risk minimization objective, which is very common in the, in, in the uh, well, in, in machine learning. <laughs> so uh, the idea is that we minimize the, the empirical the loss function. Okay, that's essentially it. Subject to constraint that the mappings are in certain function classes. Okay. And then we are going to measure the learning performance using population risk. This is also very common in, in the uh, understanding of learning. Okay, so it's just the expectation, okay. All right, so our framework is actually motivated by the fusion problem, which turns out to be one of the most researched aspects of uh, multimodal learning. And a common form of it actually looks like this. Uh, let me quickly get the picture, out. right. So it's something like this. So you have different modalities and say you have uh, different neural network encoders and then you do an aggregation and eventually you pass it that through a classifier and you get the output. 
It's a very common form. Of course, there's another also very common form, but uh, uh, they're, they're quite close. So I'm just showing this an, as an example. Okay, and uh, there have been many recent works that actually fall into this uh, fusion uh, framework. Okay. And so I give you two examples of, of some recent architectures that people propose. Uh, the first one here is uh, audio visual fusion for a sound recognition. And so you can see that there is sound, there is image, they pass through different neural networks. And through complicated combinations, they, you, you map that into a latent space. Okay, so it, this is essentially the G function. And another example is this. This is uh, image and text. And uh, similarly, uh, on top here, they use transformer. And, but but uh, here, the image and, and text are basically the, got encoded and mapped that into latent space. Okay, all right. So uh, our first, we, we first try to understand uh, 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 how we can achieve better learning with multimodal. Okay, so to do that, we propose this metric here called latent representation quality. And its definition is that for each function g, in the function class, we're going to define this eta of g, uh, which is the, the inf of, uh, basically it's the minimum uh, population risk compared to the true mappings over the entire mapping function class. And uh, well, intuitively, a better representation uh, has a smaller eta value. Okay. And with this definition, we can actually establish the following result, which says that, uh, so if you're given a set of uh, m data points and uh, we use M modalities and M modalities uh, uh, respectively to change the model. And, and we get these HM and GMs for the different modality sets. Uh, then with high probability, this bound here hold, which says that the population risk and the M modalities minus the population risk and the M modalities can be upper bounded by the latent representation quality plus something that's order one over square root of M. Okay, and we define the, we, we denote this difference as gamma of mn. And here we can easily see that when m goes to infinity, that is when you have sufficient data, uh, essentially it becomes that the left-hand side is more than or equal to gamma of s, or gamma of m and n. Okay, so uh, what does this bound tell us? Well, it tells us that if gamma of mn is non-positive, meaning that the a latent representing, uh, representation quality under M modalities is better than that under uh, M modalities, then we actually have a better performance in terms of population risk. And so, I mean, it, the result is in some sense intuitive in the sense that it basically implies that a better uh, latent representation is gonna lead to a better learning performance. So intuitively, this is correct. It's just that we, we establish um, sort of a rigorous statement for this, uh, uh, this observation that people often observe in, in, in practice. And then we have our second uh, result. We try to sort of bound the distance between the, the uh, model that we learned to the, the actual true mapping. And so we obtain bounds for this latent representation quality. Uh, and we have something like this, the eta of uh, G of M is more than or equal to some constant times the random market complexity, plus this is the center empirical loss, plus something that's again order one over m. So that the exact forms might not be that uh, important, but uh, let me quickly remark. So random market complexity, uh, uh, I assume that people here, thanks. People here knows what it is. It basically try, captures the complexity of the model. And so if you look at this bound, right, I mean, it, uh, and we try to compare it using M modalities as, as M modalities. And uh, we see that if somehow our right-hand side of using M modalities is smaller than the right-hand side of, of that under M modalities, then intuitively using M is, is better, gets us a better later representation, and it also leads to a better learning performance. And so from this, we can also, uh, we also derive the following uh, principle that, that's gonna guide us in choosing different modalities. That is, when should I go with more modalities? And the principle uh, is obtained, uh, it's something like this. So we should choose to learn with more modalities if the center empirical loss of using n minus the center empirical loss using m is greater than or equal to uh, uh, this side here. This essentially, it, it's basically from the random market complexity. Okay. Now, it, it offers us some insights. Uh, first of all, uh, when do we use more modalities? Well. Uh, it seems that using more modalities is good, right? If n is a subset of m. And why do we do that? Uh, if you look at this, this equation, basically it tells us that 
So if you look at the, the left hand side, right, empirical loss, we know that using more modalities is going to give you a larger function class, and so it's positive. And the left hand side, uh, sorry, the right hand side is again positive, but it's nice that if, if you have more data, then the right hand side essentially is going to zero. And so it gives, offers some uh, intuitive uh, uh, guidelines. That is, now if you have sufficient data, and um, if somehow we are using more modality, then we can check this value and see which one is giving us a, a, a smaller result. And some remark on the C uh, as well, uh, because nowadays many of the function class are actually, uh, so you work with the uh, uh, neural networks, and in neural networks, things are usually over-parameterized. So in a sense that this C value here can actually be quite large. And so that's gonna make the bound uh, not as good. But uh, there, there are also some uh, novel complexity measures that can actually help us and then get through this. I'll be quick, I think I, I just have a, a few moments. So uh, that was for the general case. We also uh, look at a, a special case with the composite linear model. That is my uh, later mapping and my task mapping are both linear. So in practice, usually only one of them is linear, and the other one is typically neural network. So this can be viewed as an approximation. And so in this, we can actually prove rigorously that uh, if the loss function is L2, and then using the entire set of modalities versus using k minus one, meaning that one less is actually going to give us, uh, well, the comparison is that using everything is actually better. You can prove this rigorously. And it turns out that proving it uh, holds in general, uh, uh, it's still open. <laughs> we tried, but we didn't uh, succeed. Even for this uh, uh, quite simple model, we tried different things. But uh. And let me quickly show some empirical results, then I think I'll be on time. So we actually use a data set. Uh, it's the, uh, it has a complicated name, but it has uh, three modalities, text, video, and audio. And so with that, we evaluate the performance. So we compare the, the difference with the t test accuracy. And we, when we evaluate the test accuracy difference, we also compute our gamma mm value. Uh, so in the last case, it has to be negative to show the, uh, better performance, but in this case, it's actually po it has to be positive. And so we see that uh, we, using more modalities actually gives, uh, actually, uh, gives us a higher uh, test accuracy. Thanks. I should be done in a minute. <laughs> so, and we also see that the gamma value is positive in all these cases, so it's consistent with our theory. We also have results showing uh, uh, the uh, latent representation quality versus samples, and we see that it's, it's also kind of nice with our order one over square root of m. And uh, we also have a picture here showing the, the representation quality versus modalities, and we see that with more modalities, we actually get better representation learning. Okay. So a little bit of discussion. Uh, in, uh, I can actually skip the discussion in case anyone have, have questions, and I'll go to the conclusion. Uh, so we formulate a general multimodality learning uh, framework and propose latent representation quality, which is a, uh, an interesting metric that can help us understand the learning performance. We also theoretically uh, answer two questions, when and why multimodality outperform uh, unimodal. And this actually provides some new insights for uh, multimodal learning from the generalization perspective. So the key takeaway message is really this, this figure. So it shows that if you use more modalities, actually it's gonna give you a representation that's closer to the true uh, latent representation. That's, that's how we get the uh, better performance. And this is a reference, this work appeared in this, this year's NURPS. So with that, I will stop, and thank you very much. <laughs>